Hello, everyone. My name is Jimmy Whitaker. I'm the chief scientist in the AI and strategy group at HPE, brought on by the recent acquisition of Pachyderm. I've been deeply involved in the world of machine learning and AI for about a decade now, and my main passion is to build things that work. I started as a research engineer building NLP and speech recognition models for financial institutions, and then I moved on to managing and directing applied research teams. And what I've found in that time is that much of the time I would have liked to be spending on solving machine learning problems, tuning the models, tweaking the data sets, evaluating edge cases, and just improving the overall experience, I ended up spending uh, a lot of that time just developing tooling to give consistent results. And this is very much the issue that we're going to talk about today from crisis to clarity, ensuring reproducibility for AI. We're going to talk about an issue that's increasingly casting a shadow on the bright promise of artificial intelligence, and that's the reproducibility crisis. And we're going to give some insight into the principles that it's going to take to build a machine learning organization ready to solve any of these machine learning problems. So with that, let's get started and look at the agenda. So first, we're going to start by understanding the nature of the crisis itself. What's at stake, and if it's not addressed, how that's actually going to affect us in the long term. Now, this is more than just a technical hiccup. It touches at the very heart of what AI is supposed to be. It's supposed to be dependable and trustworthy and an efficient tool that helps us make better decisions and automate some of the complex tasks that we have. Now, after understanding the problem, we're going to move on to confronting the crisis. And this is where we're going to explore potential strategies and principles that can help us not only combat the issue head on, but also think about the problem from a bigger viewpoint uh, so that we can apply it to our particular industries. In particular, we're going to learn from experiences in software development, uh, the shift from, dev, uh, from regular just operations to DevOps, and we'll explore ways in which we can start building more reliable and transparent AI systems to avoid some of these common pitfalls. And this brings us to the next agenda item, which is how we at HPE are actively trying to solve this problem with our AI at scale platform. We'll discuss how the right platform can serve as a strong foundation for more reliable and scalable applications. In particular, we're gonna dive into two pieces of the platform and that's gonna be the data management part and the model training part. Then finally, we're going to wrap up with the conclusion and that will be uh, where we end for today. So let's get started. So first we're gonna talk about reproducibility and transparency in AI. So we're living in a time where AI is becoming increasingly pervasive in our lives, uh, from the recommendation systems that we get on our favorite streaming services to voice assistants on our phones that help us navigate our day. AI is everywhere. And while it can bring tremendous benefits, it's also posing a lot of challenges. Uh, and this reproducibility crisis is one of those biggest challenges. Now, there are two parts to the reproducibility crisis that we're going to talk about, and that's reproducibility and transparency. To put it really simply, reproducibility is about getting consistent results. If you ask your AI system the same question twice, it should ideally give you the same answer each time. Transparency, on the other hand, is about understanding how your AI system arrived at that answer. So for example, imagine you're a business owner and you're using an AI system to help you make decisions. If your AI system is not reproducible, it's like having an advisor that gives you a different advice every time you ask the same question. And if it's not transparent, it's like having an advisor who says, trust me, without explaining their reasoning. And this wouldn't fly at any reputable organization. So without reproducibility, we might risk being inconsistent with our decision making based on uh, changing outputs or just any differences in the input. But what, uh, without transparency, we risk just blind faith. Uh, we don't understand. The need, and, uh, and this leads to a lot of risks uh, just on, on, on the trust itself around the AI model. In either case, we're risking losing trust, actually, and the very systems that we're using are supposed to help build trust. And so this is this is critical just to the adoption of AI. Now, just real quickly, some might ask why we're incorporating transparency here instead of exclusively talking about reproducibility uh, in a reproducibility talk. Uh, but the reason we're talking about transparency is because perfect reproducibility isn't always achievable, as we'll see later on. Uh, and in these cases, transparency becomes more and more important to reduce risk there. But overall, the stakes are really high and the costs of misinformed decisions can be really substantial. So this could be financial losses to damaged reputations. In extreme cases, businesses can, can, uh, can face regulatory, regulatory sanctions. Um, so when we talk about the AI crisis, it's not just about algorithms and data. It's about trust and accountability and just the way we do business in the, in the era of AI, really. Um, and that's the crucial thing that we want to talk about today. 
So let's talk, dive into a practical example real quick. So the use of AI in facial recognition. I mean, we're, we're pretty used to this. We have, uh, we have it on our phones that helps unlock the phones itself. It's recognizing our faces. Um, and the significance to transparency and reproducibility uh, is really key here. Um, so for instance, complex models like convolutional neural networks or CNNs uh, are commonly used in facial recognition and they're typically treated as black boxes. The decision-making process can be really opaque if you look at the ones and zeros and just the algorithm itself and what's going on there. And it can lead to a lot of challenges when we're trying to uh, evaluate decisions based on bias or um, how, is our data set actually uh, useful for the data it's being applied to. After biased identifications not only erode public confidence, but it can also result in regulatory repercussions. So while simple models might be more interpretable, their performance might be compromised in the process, leading to a lower overall like valuable outcome. Now, reproducibility in AI uh, is an interesting one. So it's while it's challenging, it's not always unattainable. Uh, and so to achieve a higher level of reproducibility in facial recognition systems, we can do a lot of things. So we can fix the initialization in seeds. We can uh, we can use deterministic algorithms, version control our data, and do valued validation on all kinds of hardware to make sure there's no uh, non-determinism in the hardware. But ultimately, the uh, the things that we need to apply are going to be dependent on our use case. Um, so, for instance, and this is where transparency starts to come in. So, if reproducibility becomes infeasible in some of these scenarios, uh, transparency about what data went into the system and doing testing around our data and the bias, for instance, for uh, if there's racial bias in a uh, facial recognition model, then this can lead to making unjustifiable uh, predictions or classifying people as the same same person, and that can lead to security risks and other things. So uh, reproducibility definitely needs to be a focus, but then we need to incorporate transparency more and more um, as, as if things are not going to be uh, fully reproducible. So we talked a little bit about the cost of neglecting uh, reproducibility and transparency, but I just wanted to double down on this. Now, I'm not going to read everything in this slide, but really, uh, ultimately, it comes down to um, non neglecting reproducibility and transparency undermines just trust in our AI systems. Uh, and this is essential for widespread adoption and effective decision making. If our outcomes cannot be reproducible or understood, stakeholders may be reluctant to rely on AI insights, and this can lead to missed opportunities for innovation and efficiency and many other things. But this can also foster the propagation of bias uh, or incorrect results, which have significant societal and ethical ramifications. So for instance, in a worst case scenario, a biased AI system could lead to unfair practices or harm individuals or groups, or even cause loss of life if we think about things such as autonomous vehicles and so on and so forth. Um, but even just at the end of the day for our teams uh, on, on like a, a semi short term or just uh, immediate focus, uh, a lack of reproducibility and transparency can just lead to a huge waste of resources. So without reproducibility, researchers can uh, be basing their work on flawed studies or models or lead to a lot of waste uh, with time and money and effort or compute even being spent uh, to propagate further errors. So in sum, neglecting reproducibility and transparency compromises not only the integrity of the system, but also the utility and can even have some ethical applications in AI as well. So now let's move on to kind of the main part of our discussion, and that's going to be how we confront the crisis. So in, ever, in order to navigate this complex landscape, it's beneficial to draw parallels from other fields that have gone through similar transformations. Uh, and in particular, the one that we're going to focus on is DevOps in the world of software development. So you now, now you, uh, you may wonder why and what does this have to do with machine learning? And as we'll go deeper into this section, we're going to draw some parallels um, but basically, the principles of DevOps uh, and the requirements of building a robust machine learning system are pretty similar to software development. And at the high level, De DevOps is uh, just the word itself is a combination of development and operations. And it refers to a set of practices that emphasize collaboration between software developers and other IT professionals to deliver software more reliably. It's been called a revolution in creating a culture and environment for development of software, uh, where developing and testing and releasing software are all happening rapidly and frequently and more reliable. And much like in software development a decade ago, machine learning needs its own kind of DevOps revolution today. 
And this means we need to incorporate a set of best practices that can guide data scientists and machine learning engineers and even other stakeholders in the industry uh, to work together effectively to create models that are not just high performing, but also reliable, uh, understandable and easy to replicate. And this gets back to our reproducibility and transparency topic. But what's different about machine learning systems and how we incorporate these techniques uh, from that of DevOps? So for instance, right here, if we look at this slide, uh, we can see that the, some of the key developments that happened for DevOps to uh, to allow us to be able to iterate quickly was version control, which is managing all the different versions of the code so we can go back to the previous version or CICD where we can automate the testing uh, and automate the deployments of things so that they're standardized and there's not a lot of human in there. Um, agile, agile development practices where we're going very quickly on solving very short-term, near-term problems and incorporating feedback from end customers and so on and so forth. Just this, this huge uh, shift to a rapid iteration and focusing on uh, the task at hand um, and delivering quickly on that, but also reliably has kind of been the key, some of the key components for DevOps. But also one of the main focuses is uh, testing and version control. And so as we're thinking about machine learning, we should be thinking about these, uh, these systems and how these systems interact uh, or some of these key developments and how they apply. And that's what we're going to do here. The most significant difference between traditional software and machine learning development, though, is the data. So while in traditional software, we just had this code and that was the living thing, the thing that was constantly changing and moving. But in machine learning, data is really our new source code. It tells our model what it should be, what should be learned. Uh, and we have machine learning techniques, which is our code, uh, that tells our model how to learn from that data. So in machine learning development, this really leads to two life cycles. We have the coding life cycle, and then we also have the data life cycle. In the code life cycle, this is the aspect of MLOps that aligns the most closely with software development. It starts with developing the code from the, for the machine learning model, often in a collaborative way, and this code gets versioned and stored in a data, um, sorry, in a code repository, which enables tracking and challenge and, and incorporates any changes and rollbacks if needed and facilitates collaboration between team members. And then this code goes through testing and validation stages uh, to make sure that it's ready for production or for use uh, when applying it to data. We can think a lot about um, kind of just the practices behind the building of PyTorch or Hugging Face and some of the libraries that are used across the industry. We want to make sure that those uh, those coding repositories uh, and the software that's produced by them is really, really reliable. The data lifecycle on the other side is a much more unique aspect of machine learning operations or MLOps. In the context of machine learning, this includes stages such as data collection and cleaning and processing, but it also involves managing data versions. So similar to managing our code versions, our data is going to change and we're going to be fixing bugs in our data and everything else over time. And what we need to make sure of is that not only can we track the data that's used in our training and our testing for each model version, but we also want to make sure that this, uh, this performance is continuously monitored and improved over time. If the model's performance is deteriorating uh, as we're incorporating new data, then this should actually be able to trigger a new cycle of, a new cycle of data collection, pre-processing, and model training. And managing the complexities of the data lifecycle is really crucial for machine learning operations, uh, especially given the, the importance uh, if, of data just determining the performance of our machine learning models. Uh, the data integrity and traceability is ultimately going to be what is most valuable to our machine learning uh, models at the end of the day. So if we look back at the software development diagram that we saw earlier, we originally had our code and then our running system and some of the tests that we needed to apply to that code during the process. So for instance, our unit tests test our code and what it's doing locally, the integration tests test how that code is going to go into production, and then we monitor the system once it's in production. And this is fine for the coding lifecycle because we're just iterating on the code. But as we saw, we have these two life cycles now, and really data is the only new life cycle that we're incorporating, but there's different touch points within the entire system. So not only do we have to test our, uh, our code as we did originally, but we also have data tests that need to come in. And we're testing our data as it, uh, as it enters our model training process and as it's coming in from our external systems and even just monitoring the predictions that our models are making in production. And this is an essential challenge in machine learning. There are a lot of these moving pieces and we need to bring this, uh, these different components together. And for our system to be truly transparent and debuggable, each of these intersection points must uphold the same standards of reproducibility and transparency as any other part of the process. 
And this ensures that when errors do arise, they can be tracked back to their origin, allowing for dependable iteration and refinements of the system. Now, this is going to seem a little bit overwhelming for a moment, but if we really tease out all the interactions that we see, uh, then there's quite a few operational situations that we need to consider. Here we have the different machine learning ops principles on the left side, and then the different interaction component, uh, interaction, I guess, verticals, if you will, on the right side. So we have the coding lifecycle and the data lifecycle. But this one new thing that we have is this model training step, which is combining the code with the data. And this not only leads to uh, the convergence point of the data and the code lifecycle, but it also produces new artifacts that are new pieces of data that need to be managed as well. So what we can see here is really just a matrix of the different principles and how they apply in these different situations. And your situation may be even be uh, more different. For instance, when your model is in production, some of your production monitoring may trigger some of these. And then there's an interaction there that you need to consider. But overall, uh, I wanted to give you this high level view of what the uh, what the machine learning ops principles are and then how they apply in some of these different scenarios uh, so that you can form your own uh, just mental image of how these things should connect inside of your own organization. And so uh, this may look very, very uh, complex or overwhelming at first. Uh, we're going to make it a little bit more complex, but then we're also going to show how, how we're approaching the solution and what are some of the basics um, of the platforms that HPE is building to solve some of these problems. So to take this one step further, in the early stages of building machine learning models, you often start with small experiments on a single machine. And this may be uh, you're just a team of one. This is your day one. You're trying to work out how to solve a, a particular problem. And the infrastructure is relatively simple to manage. There's no real need to share resources or data sets or productionized results. And at this stage, ad hoc experiment tracking, where you simply keep notes or records about what you did and how uh, you obtain those results, is typically a sufficient process to go through. However, as our operation scales, uh, the landscape really changes dramatically. <clears throat> when you start working with larger data sets or more complex models and a larger team of data scientists and machine learning engineers, a lot of new requirements start to emerge. So you now have many users accessing and modifying shared resources from data sets and model parameters. Uh, there's various data sources to manage and possibly a mix of technologies from different machine learning frameworks to cloud resources and even on-premise hardware that you need to incorporate into your uh, overall workflow. <clears throat> and one of the most significant shifts is the need for systematic experiment tracking uh, for reproducibility and collaboration, and it's no longer feasible to rely on these ad hoc notes. Instead, we need a system that can automatically track all the aspects of the experiment. <clears throat> that is the data that's used, the model parameters, the training process, and all the results that are gathered from those different interactions. And this not only helps us ensure reproducibility, but it also aids in collaboration. So as team members can easily understand and replicate what you've done, uh, you can build upon each other's work and achieve even better results. Now, you might also start dealing with more advanced machine learning technologies, such as distributed training, where the model is copied across multiple machines and there's GPU sharing. Uh, or you might uh, also need to incorporate hyperparameter searches or processes to find the optimal parameters for a model. And this can be really resource intensive and complex to, ma uh, to manage. And all of this needs to be supported by robust infrastructure management. At the end of the day, it all turns into infrastructure at some, somewhere, and you need to be able to allocate and monitor these resources, uh, handle security and privacy requirements and everything else. And so I threw a bunch of things out, and this is a little bit of an overwhelming uh, situation. And it, frankly, it should feel a little bit overwhelming because there's, there's a lot of moving pieces. But in essence, as you move from small-scale experiments to a full-scale machine learning ops uh, operation, uh, the complexity increases significantly. However, by effectively managing this transition, you can develop a robust and scalable system that enables efficient development, deployment, and even the maintenance of these high-quality machine learning models. So finally, this brings us to uh, HPE, where I am right now as part of the Pachyderm acquisition, our vision for the AI at scale platform. So our vision is to build the world's best platform for developing and deploying AI applications at scale. And some of the features of this platform, uh, there's really three key components, and that's the data processing or the data management side, the development environment, which is more of our training side, and then the inference side. 
Much of the HPE stack is built around productionizing the best in breed open source technologies. So while we'll mainly be focusing on the HPE versions of these uh, products, so MLDM, so uh, the machine learning data management here, and MLDE, the machine learning development environment here, they have their roots in open source. For example, MLDM is the fully integrated enterprise version of Pachyderm, the company I was a part of before the HPE acquisition. And similarly, MLDE is the fully integrated version of Determined AI, uh, and also acquired by HPE. But these two products are being brought together. So don't worry, these products are still available open source for anyone. Uh, but at HPE, we're combining these together to kind of provide this holistic, assist, this holi holistic system. So we're going to talk about each one of these components. So first, the MLDM, which used to be Pachyderm, uh, is an open source platform that provides data versioning and data lineage with automated pipelines. And these, help, these features help manage the data lifecycle in a machine learning ops context. So with uh, MLDM, you can version your data just like you version your code, which aids in reproducibility. Uh, the data lineage feature allows you to trace each piece of data from its source to its destination through the pipelines. And then finally, the results uh, that we get are reproducible from the pipeline perspective, uh, which can also enhance transparency of what code went into which piece of data and what was uh, produced by it. And automating these pipelines to facilitate efficient data processing and model transformation, that means we can also scale this process up. And we'll see more about this one in a minute. Next in the stack is our MLDE environment. And so uh, this is our deep learning training platform that can handle tasks like hyperparameter tuning, experiment tracking, resource management, and many other things that are involved in your model training journey. It helps scale the machine learning development from one user to many, enabling collaboration and reproducibility. And it also provides a lot of powerful tools to uh, quickly uh, to train models more quickly and optimize resource usage in the process. And so this means we can not only manage our experiments, but we can also share experiments and results and models, all of which are really crucial in the uh, as we move up in complexity for our MLOps operation. Finally, we have this all standardized uh, on a Kubernetes-based deployment for model serving, uh, or sorry, for serving machine learning models. Uh, we provide a, a lot of scalable ways to do um, to actually serve out uh, the different types of models that we might be building and provide features uh, like canary deployments and other types of things there to ensure that your models are available and performing well in production as well. So together, these three tools provide an end-to-end -end solution for MLOps, covering the data lifecycle with uh, Pachyderm or MLDM, the model training and management with Determined AI and ML slash MLDE, and our model serving. So this integrated software stack can help us address the challenges of reproducibility, transparency, and even start adding in collaboration and scalability uh, that is all crucial for MLOps. This will enable us to develop high quality models, but then also do this in a more effective and efficient way. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, our HPE's machine learning data management <clears throat> system. So MLDM is a data versioning, data lineage, and automated pipeline system built on top of Kubernetes. It consists of two primary components, which are the data management system, which under the hood is uh, the Pachyderm file system, and the, uh, the pipeline system, which under the hood is our Pachyderm pipeline system, if you're familiar with those con concepts. Uh, on the <clears throat> data management system side, it's a distributed file system for storing and versioning your data, and it provides Git-like version controls uh, and semantics to, to your data, but it can be data of any size. This scales up to the petabyte level if you need it to, and potentially even beyond. Uh, so, And then secondly, our pipeline system, uh, which is a computation layer that enables complex data transformations in a directed acyclic graph or a DAG, if you're familiar with that. Uh, of containerized tasks. And so this means that we can build up pipelines of containerized uh, workflows that ensures that not only are these, uh, these pipelines always up to date, but then they can also uh, be triggered whenever new data comes in. So with the MLDM, data is stored in data repositories and pipelines of data transformations end up getting automatically triggered when new data is committed. And Pachyderm also supports branching and merging of data uh, that allows for isolated changes and easy experimentation. Lastly, Pachyderm's data lineage, uh, MLDM Pachyderm, uh, its data lineage features help us track each piece of data from its source to its final form. And so this enha enhances a lot of transparency and helps troubleshoot, uh, especially in audits. Um, and this version data and data-driven pipelines components, as they're combined together, end up being the fundamental components uh, in addressing the challenges of reproducibility and transparency for machine learning models. 
So if we look at it a little bit more detail, this is a, these are a couple of uh, segments of snapshots from uh, the console product for MLDM. And we can see just how a little bit how of how uh, reproducibility and transparency can kind of work. So data versioning is akin to version control for code, but in this case, we're applying it to data. And every change to the data set, uh, a new version is created and captured so we can always roll back uh, or recreate the exact conditions under which uh, a model was built, for example, uh, and enable a lot of reproducible uh, transactions like that. On the transparency side, uh, as we have our version data uh, that's going through these data-driven pipelines, these pipelines provide a clear view of how the data was processed and how it was transformed from one form to another. And this can be really useful not only to produce a final model output, but it gives us visibility to understand the, the complete data flow, how data flowed from the origin all the way into this trained model that was put into production uh, and help us identify potential bias and errors and even explain the model's output pot uh, potentially um, and how it contributed to the overall, uh, the overall system that it's working in. And together, these two components, version data and data-driven pipelines, are a powerful combination that allow us to build machine learning models that are not only effective, but also trustworthy and accountable. So the second thing we're going to talk about is MLDE, so the machine learning development environment. So once we've curated and tested our data with uh, MLDM, with Pachyderm, then we can begin our modeling workflow. So where we're training our model, where we're experimenting and everything else. And MLDE, which is uh, the open source version is Determined AI, is a platform specifically designed to tackle these challenges uh, that are encountered in the lifecycle of machine learning model development. And this provides a lot of capabilities that are just absolutely essential as you're scaling up, in particular, deep learning, uh, machine learning workflows. And so this can incorporate things like hyperparameter search, where you're trying to efficiently find the best performing uh, hyperparameters to train your model, experiment tracking, distributed training, and many other things that are listed here. But in summary, uh, the machine learning development environment, MLDE, acts as a force multiplier for data science teams and enables them to efficiently not only manage uh, the resources, but also reproduce results and ultimately build models faster uh, and also at scale. So we incorporate this collaboration component as well. So when we start thinking about how the machine learning development environment can address our reproducibility channel challenges, there are a few different things that are going on here. One is that we can incorporate deterministic model training. And this means that we can uh, use some deterministic algorithms to train our models and make sure that we're sampling uh, and setting seed values and everything else to make sure that our models are exactly reproducible every time. The other thing that we can do is make sure we have model registries for when those models get handed off to other, uh, other systems, whether it's being handed off to our inference product or uh, other components there, but having a single source of truth for <clears throat> those different models that were trained and also being able to ensure all the, the traceability and the experiment and metadata tracking that was behind those models. And all these things together are not just giving us uh, a way to approach reproducible machine learning, but they're also giving us a lot of, uh, of transparency into the process and how we got to the end result, which can help us build new models and uh, adapt our techniques for the future. But it's not always that simple. So in, uh, in model training, there's a lot of challenges for reproducibility, and it may not always be feasible. So for instance, reproducibility uh, in the world of deep learning is the pursuit of it. It often feels like we're kind of chasing a mirage. So there's inherent, uh, inherent randomness in model training, uh, typically due to GPUs or how we get efficient algorithms. They incorporate some level of randomness. And differences in software and hardware environments and even variations in the data used for training and testing can all contribute to this, this elusive dream of reproducible AI. <clears throat> and while this might seem disheartening at first, it's important to remember that our goal isn't absolute perfection in, uh, in machine learning model training, but rather maximum reproducibility uh, and transparency into the process. We're striving for building models that are robust and more credible, but not about recreating every final result with exact precision. So we can think about uh, all the way back to our analogy with traditional software development, which was key. Um, and in that traditional software development side, 100% uh, code coverage for testing cases is not the goal, but producing reliable, incredible software is the goal. And uh, just making something reproducible may still not get us there. And that's why concentrating on not only reproducibility and transparency, uh, but concentrating on both together are, uh, are both incredibly important. So for instance, in this example right here, we're talking about how uh, these different numerical differences can be uh, essentially crucial, uh, not only for 
um, training models efficiently, but they can also limit determinism. And the ways that we mitigate this is by co combining tools like MLDE with uh, things like MLDM, so we can know exactly what data went into something, uh, but also know the different ways that it was trained. So we have transparency in the process and uh, reproducibility in the process as well. So finally, we're going to uh, just finish off with talking about this AI at scale workflow. Uh, so the beauty of this platform really lies in its flexibility. It's, des it's designed to mold to your individual process, which means we're not really biased to uh, an exact way to do things, um, but it can also fit seamlessly into your development workflow. So here we see a simplified example uh, that begins with versioning data, uh, moves on to training our model and then testing our model where we have reproducible inputs from our data uh, versioning software. We are have automation around our pipelines, we have experiment tracking in our model training, and then we have some post-processing and deployment, all of which is uh, can be automated and uh, capture the robust interplay between data management and also uh, developing our machine learning models. And in one application, uh, the AI at scale platform, we're able to use the different um, these different components to standardize our operations for building things like computer vision models or large language models and many other things, uh, just using this one platform and the different components together. So let's recap what we've explored. So AI brings many complexities to software systems and it introduces new risks with uh, a lack of reproducibility and transparency. And this lack can lead to misaligned outputs and uh, difficulties in troubleshooting and even just de decreased uh, trust across the entire industry. Um, and the solution lies not in, uh, not in just trying harder to make our models reproducible, but really it lies in um, adopting tooling and processes that provide versioning and reproducibility and automation and workflow enhancements across both the coding lifecycle and the data lifecycles. And so our proposed platform addresses these challenges, uh, trying to provide a comprehensive end-to-end -end AI lifecycle uh, software platform that's tailored not just to complex AI use cases, but a general platform to build out many use cases. Um, so it's a robust system designed to, to mitigate a lot of these risks and increase efficiency and ultimately uh, drive a successful AI integration across your entire uh, company and system. And with that, uh, we're going to close out. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions.